Hey everyone, Graham from Loudwire here, and it's Wikipedia Fact or Fiction time with the one and only Marty Friedman. Thank you so much for being here, man. I appreciate you so much. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Okay, so this is Wikipedia Fact or Fiction. I went and got some stuff from your Wikipedia page today. Uh, the bands, the albums, looked through all the stuff, pulled out some things. You can confirm or deny and elaborate if you'd be so kind. <laughs> okay, so first of all, because we do always like to check, Martin Adam Friedman, born in Laurel, Maryland. Uh, I was born in Washington, D.C. See, they get that wrong. They always get the birthplace wrong. Washington, D.C., okay. Yeah, I grew Pretty up in close. Laurel, but... Uh, yeah. Okay, fairly close, so a little bit of fiction there. This is like like passport control, right? Now. I know, I, I'm very into the minutia of everything. Right. Uh, it said at the age of 14, after attending a KISS concert, is when you took up the guitar, and you are largely self-taught. Right. That's true. Right. Okay, so when you started playing the guitar, were you uh, more of a guy who would listen and then try to mimic what you were hearing and learn that way? Mm. I had a really good teacher for a couple months. Okay. And, um, but he was kind of more into, I don't know, more of a Woodstock way of musical thinking and playing, and I was more into, like, I wanted punk rock in my life. Yes. So uh, he taught me some really good basics, but... I'm like, you know what, I can learn this Ramon stuff on my own. At, back in those days, Kiss was con considered punk. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And uh, all the, anything that only had three or four chords in it was punk. Sure, sure. So I learned that stuff on my own, and I'm like, you know, I'm starting to develop my year with that. Mm. And um, I'm really glad I started there, because if I had learned different things, I wouldn't have had that gratification. Uh, it says uh, that the mother of one of your friends ran an event center with a two-level stage. Uh, you would practice there with a band. Soon, word spread about the band, and since you were in a rural area, people would come from miles away to socialize and listen to your music. Yes. Wow. It's awesome. the coolest thing. The, the rhythm guitarist and vocalist of my band, Deuce, his mother, literally mother, herself, with hammer, nails, and wood, built a huge barn with a proper two-level stage drum riser, wow. PA board set up, the whole thing by herself. And so if you can imagine, it was like on this deserted field in the middle of Laurel, Maryland. So here we are, we're like 14-year-old kids in yeah. this band. Everybody's coming from the entire county, other counties, and it was a party every single night. And we were jamming in front of everybody. And it was a concert every night because you had to perform. You yeah. Know? Of course, we could barely play, but like, you know, when there's people in front of you, you get, you get this feeling you're forced to be in the moment and do the right thing. And we just loved it. It was just such a party. And, you know, we felt like rock stars because people, you know, they don't know, they don't know we suck. <laughs> they don't know we suck. And they're like, ah, oh, you guys are fantastic. They you know? kept coming back at least. They kept coming back. <laughs> yeah. And like, actually, like, I lived out my rock star all that rock star stuff by the time I was 17. Wow. And luckily I got it out of my system then because, you know, playing music for a lifetime is a lot different than the excesses of rock stardom, you know what I mean? If you want to sure. continue with your career. So I got serious right after that, but that was probably the most fun any teenager could have and really wow. grounded me as for, you know, basic performance concepts. You know, people are there even though they didn't pay, but they might have paid in beer or oh, in sure, other yeah. ways, you know? Other ways that um, I guess is legal here in a lot of places <laughs> and other ways that are still illegal. <laughs> yes. But they, they paid and they showed up and they showed their support. So you get this feeling like you really want to give them a million percent and just pour your heart out to them. So that I got from my early days. Oh, how Sorry cool. for the long answer. No, no, we love the long answers, absolutely. Uh, I found a contradiction. Uh, it said that your audition for Megadeth, it said that uh, you received a tip from Jeff Loomis, uh, but then another page said that uh, Ron Lafitte, a, mem a member of Capital Management, is the one who suggested you go. Neither of those is true. Neither is Neither true. Neither of them is true. Yeah. So what happened? Um, I had a friend, uh, still a good friend of mine named Bob Nalbandian. Right now he's doing some fantastic uh, documentaries on heavy metal and stuff. Oh, cool. Brilliant guy. He's been my friend since forever. And he heard about Megadeth's audition. He called me up and said, dude, they're looking for a guitar player. If you're interested, call Ron Lafitte, who was Megadeth's manager at the okay. time. Okay, gotcha. I didn't know anybody in the band or Lafitte. And um, I called and that's what happened. Okay. And I know Jeff very well. And, uh, and um, 
we, he's actually guessed it on my record and I've guessed it on his record and he's a tremendous guitarist, good friend of mine, but he had nothing to do with anything back then. Okay, very good to know. Okay, that's a, that's a double fallacy on that one. See, this is why we do this. Uh, it said that you were initially rejected for Megadeth because you had multicolored hair. No, I was never rejected. <laughs> But I did have multicolored hair. Yeah, okay. And it might have caused a stir among the, you know, what, if they were having any meetings about me in the band, they might have talked about it, but no one said. Okay. I basically got the gig the day of the audition. Right, that's what I had always heard. And, um, you know, but I would have been happy to adjust it. I mean, I didn't have multicolored hair on purpose. You know, I was really broke and, like, borderline homeless, you know, living with girls who I didn't even know who they were, yeah. stuff like that. So I didn't have the type of money to attend like proper salons and stuff. So I might have <laughs> colored my hair at one time and it halfway grew out. Yeah, yeah. It wasn't like I was trying to do some kind of trendy half-half type of thing. It just was what it was. Wow. Okay. This is like all fiction so far. Oh boy. Yeah, I did a lot of like tuning up after after I joined Megadeth, because before then it was really sad state of affairs, you know. So like I got maybe some. I was wearing wearing very ripped up jeans and old ratty T-shirts and stuff. And you know, when you're in a band that is on a major label, you have to look somewhat decent. <laughs> and the cool thing about Megadeth was they were like kind of straight edge at that time, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, they right. were really kind of like guy next door type of thing. Everybody mm -hmm. looked healthy and presentable and everybody could speak nicely and I had to kind of come up to that and before then I was living in a very tiny place eating like one bucket of rice a day and yeah. lollipops wow. so you know my hair was one of the, one of many things I could finally afford to like wash it more than twice a week uh, it said uh, that for Countdown to Extinction yourself and Dave Ellison uh, were especially disappointed that Megadeth did not win the Grammy I think m maybe what that is, they have the Grammy Awards, right? And yeah. I hope my memory is correct on this. Dave Ellison and I were the only ones who went to it. Oh, okay, gotcha. So we actually went to the ceremony. Sure. And we drive in there, we get in there, everybody's, you guys are definitely gonna get it. You guys are, everybody's, you know, blowing sun mm. sunshine yeah. up our skirts about this. And I didn't really know who the other bands were. I mean, Nine Inch Nails was in there, and we knew them, we liked them. Sure. But it wasn't like, they were like all over the charts and they had a history. They'd just come out, you yeah. know, so we liked them, but we had no idea. I think they got it. I think they got the I Grammy. think, was it Wish that they got it for? Or it was their debut, yeah. debut music. But okay. anyway, we got in there. We, everybody was like telling us we were gonna get it. Mm. We didn't get it. And our car hadn't even parked yet. They read oh, our okay. thing off first, or uh, like okay. early in the thing, yeah. and we left and our car has, didn't even have a parking space yet, <laughs> so we left. But I don't think we are con totally disappointed or down about it. I mean, the yeah. awards don't really mean much, especially in metal. Uh, on Risk, it said that you heavily encouraged Dave Mustaine to indulge in his pop sensibilities for the record. That and heavier stuff, too. Oh, so the, yeah, the dynamics. I wanted it to be like, Either or and both. Like I didn't want it to be down the middle. Like you were talking about Japanese music almost. You know? Yeah, I wanted yeah. like, for example, like you have a band like X Japan, who I was yeah. into at the time. They have these ultra, ultra heavy metal sounds kinda like new wave of British heavy metal songs on ten. Sure. And then they have these like Barry Manilow ballads. Yeah. And it's those that contrast that really appealed to me. And in Megadeth, I thought with a name like Megadeth, we should be fucking heavy as fuck. And then we could afford to have something that's like a, you know, not a poppy ballad, but like kind of a ballad that works. Like uh, I have a lot of respect for Metallica and they did a ballad and it still sounded like them. And I'm yeah. like, why can't we do something like that? You know, and so I was wanted to do really, really heavy stuff and something that could also appeal to people who don't like their tempos that fast. And there's room for everything. And uh, actually all of us at that time, Co uh, cooperated as best as we could, and there was no fighting about anything as far as I remember. Wow. Uh, it said that you left Megadeth because you got tired of playing metal at that time and felt like you were not evolving as a musician. I don't know about tired of playing metal, but tired of kind of holding the flag up for traditional metal. Gotcha. Which okay. is what I saw happening, and, um, and I just needed to 
there was so much more that I wanted to do, so much more musically I had to say, and I thought that Megadeth could go on with their goals a lot better with a different person in tow, and they did. You know, they got a lot of great guys who are more suited to what they were trying to do than I was, so I think it was a win-win for everybody. Last one for you. It says that you don't quite like being called a shredder. Right. That's true. It's very okay. true. Is it, do you think it's too limiting, or...? Extremely, and I don't know, like, terms change over the years, you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, slang, and especially if you're out of the country, you don't know what the slang is here nowadays. What's the latest slang here for... For a guitarist? For, that's cool or something. Oh. Fire. Fire? Yeah, people say that's fire. Do you guys know fire? The kids say that. Really? Yeah, that's, that's that fire. one's too young for me even. Yeah, it's fire. Fire. Yeah, see, like, so, like, I don't know what shredder means now, but... Um, you know, the people who are saying it about me, I know they're saying it with love and yeah, because absolutely. they like it. So yeah. I'm totally fine with that. I'm totally fine with the intent on it. But when I think of that word, I think of a lot of things that I completely don't like about what often happens in the field of metal and the field of guitar playing, which is just this, I guess the words mindless come to mind, just very, very fast and with little concern of what's going on under the music and just little musicality that appeals to me. Now, there's no good music, there's no bad music, there's only what you like, and that's all that matters. But when I hear, when I think of that word shredder, I just think of somebody who's just ripping really fast. And I barely do that, I mean, I do that, but when I, if you listen to when I do it, if I have a seven minute song, there might be a couple sections when I'm playing unbelievably fast, sure. but there's a reason for that, and the reason is the context. Mm -hmm. What's before, what's after it, and why it's there. That's just me, but when I hear that term, and you know, I get it because it's with the love, and they, they say it because they, they think what I'm doing is cool, and I love you for saying it, but um, I really love when people say other things, like they like my music. That's, sure. that's what I like even more. Awesome. Marty, thank you so much for being here. Appreciate it so much. One Bad MF Live thank is you. the new record. Pick that up. It is available right now. Marty Friedman, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much.